All right, this morning we have a topic that is not really coming to you from outer space. It really, really is true. It really happened. And in our modern day, it might sound a bit strange to you, but I want to try to make it very practical and very real to you. And that's the topic of the secret art of Puritan meditation. Puritans practiced a certain method of meditation. And I want to convey that method to you. I had an um, assignment for a conference in South Carolina to discuss Puritan view of meditation. Since I had only one book on the subject in my entire library, I figured this would be a pretty easy go. Well, I got really involved in it, and I discovered there were 41 books written by the Puritans on meditation, 40 of them out of print. And I read them all. And I spent a whole summer studying this subject and discovered that no one was talking about it, no one was thinking about it today. We have lost the art, for the most part, of meditation. Now, as ministers, we do some meditating, of course, at every sermon we preach, and you do some meditation. But a deliberate art of meditation, we're really strangers of. So I want to bring that message to you this morning. Psalm 1, let's read the first three verses as just one place, just one place of Dozens of places in the Bible where the Lord says we should meditate. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Let's pray. Gracious God, bless this talk on meditation that at the end of it, each young person here may make a holy resolve to begin, to begin to spend time each day meditating on the truths of the living God. Help us in delivering this message. In Jesus' name, Amen. <coughs> Spiritual growth is critical for believers. Life is not just about getting saved and then saying, well, I'm saved, therefore I've got nothing more to do. I spoke to a husband who let himself go as soon as he got married and didn't discipline his body whatsoever. And finally, it got so bad, we had to say a word to him. And he said, well, it doesn't matter anymore because I'm married to her now, so I don't have to keep myself up. I've got her. Well, that's the way some Christians live, you see. Well, I can get sloppy in my spiritual life because, oh well, I'm saved. But you see... If you're a faithful spouse, if you're a faithful believer, you want to be fit for God. You want to please the living God as you want to please your spouse. And so, you, you want to grow in, in grace. You want to grow in your relationships. There are 300 texts in the Bible that commend or, and or command spiritual growth. Now, the Puritans would say one of the primary ways of growing is through the art of spiritual meditation. By meditation, they didn't mean some yoga exercise. They didn't mean some aspect of Buddhism or Hinduism. They meant Christian meditation. And I want to look then with you at this subject in terms of the nature of it, our duty, the manner, how you do it, spend half our time there. The subjects that you meditate on, the benefits of meditation, we'll look at a few obstacles and then we'll conclude. So first then, the nature of meditation. The Bible speaks of meditation as a thinking upon 
a reflecting or sometimes musing. While I was musing, David says, the fire burned. Psalm 39 verse 3. Meditation is a frequent theme in the Bible. When Rebecca came back from her country to, to meet and to marry Isaac, Isaac was out in the field meditating in the evening. Genesis 24, 63. When God commanded Joshua to undertake the large task of leading the people of Israel, he's going to be so busy that God says to him, be of good courage, meditate on the book of the law day and night, Joshua, that you may do all that is written in it. Joshua 1, verse 8. But the term meditation occurs the most in the Psalms. Again and again we're told, Blessed is the man, Psalm 1, who delights in the law of God and meditates on it day and night. Psalm 63, David speaks of remembering the Lord on his bed and meditating on Him in the night watches. Psalm 119 speaks of the psalmist's eyes meditating in God's Word that He might prevent the night watches. Now, the Puritans never tire of saying that meditation involves thinking about the triune God and thinking about His Word, God and His Word. By anchoring all meditation to the living God, Jesus Christ, the living Word, Jesus Christ, and the Bible, the written Word, Puritans distance themselves from all kinds of false uh, unbiblically mystical meditation. You know there are people and groups even today who spend all their time meditating at the expense of doing. The Puritans would be opposed to that as well. Meditation must be biblical and it must be designed to help us to do, to live, to act. Now, the Puritans said meditation must be exercised both by the mind and the heart. We must meditate both with our intellect, in other words, and our affections. Listen to Thomas Watson's definition. By the way, all the names I mentioned um, in my talks this week are, are Puritans, unless I tell you different. Thomas Watson defined meditation as a holy exercise of the mind, whereby we bring God's truths to remembrance and do seriously ponder them and apply them. All three parts are important. Bring the truths to mind, ponder them, and apply them to ourselves. Edmund Calamy, C-A-L-A-M-Y, who wrote a very influential book on meditation, said this, A true meditation is when a man does so meditate of Christ as to get his heart inflamed with the love of Christ, so meditate of the truths of God as to be transformed into those truths, and so meditate of sin as to get his heart to hate sin. And Calamity goes on to say that with good meditation, three doors are entered. The door of your understanding, the door of your heart and affections, and the door of practical living. So the goal is to meditate, Calame says, to so meditate of God as to walk as God walks, and to so meditate of Christ as to prize Him and to live in radical obedience to Him. So for the Puritans, you see, meditation was your staple way of life that undergirded your entire life. Life. It enhanced every other duty in Christian living. Like oil, lubricating an engine. So meditation facilitates the means of grace, the reading of Scripture, the hearing of sermons and prayer. It facilitates the marks of grace, like repentance and faith and humility. And it facilitates our relationship to others, uh, love to God and, and, and neighborly compassion and so on. Now, the Puritans said there are two kinds of meditation. Occasional and deliberate. 
And what do they mean by these technical terms? Well, occasional meditation is that kind of meditation that you do spontaneously every day. Now, every day as we walk around, talk to people, we're thinking. Well, the Puritans trained their mind to think spiritually as they went through their day. So let me give you an example. Um, maybe you got to this session five minutes early and you looked around and if you're a good Puritan, maybe you, you, you just came through a door and you started thinking, I'm going to meditate about spiritual applications of a door. Jesus said, I am the door. The door opens and closes. The way to Jesus is through the door. Jesus is literally the door, but He's like a door because when we go walk through, we, we find life abundant in Jesus. And if the door is closed, there's no truth coming to us if Jesus is not our open door. And then you might start thinking of some biblical texts. I've set an open door before you. You might start thinking, well, what open doors has God given me in my life? What means has He given to me to use in Christ to, to be like a door that I might open truth to others? And you, know, and you just go on like that. This is natural to the Puritans to think this way. Because you're so filled with the Bible, you see. You're so filled with God's truth that you spiritualize things always consistent with principles in Scripture, not just on biblical mysticism. But they called that occasional meditation. And they said, this is biblical. It's what David did with the moon and stars in Psalm 8. It's what Solomon did with the ants in Proverbs 6. All kinds of lessons. He gathered spiritual lessons from the ants. It's what Jesus did with well water in John 4, talking to the Samaritan woman. So, Thomas Manton explains exactly how you do this. Now, listen carefully. This is a Puritan language, so it just takes a, a bit more because they pack a lot into a sentence. God trained up the old church by types and ceremonies so that upon a common object they might ascend with spiritual thoughts to God. And our Lord in the New Testament taught by parables and similitudes taken from ordinary functions and offices among men that in every trade and calling we might be employed in our worldly business with a heavenly mind. So that whether we are at our shop or at the loom or in the field, we might still be thinking about Christ in heaven. That's all one sentence. So occasional meditation is relatively easy for a believer because you can practice it at any time, any place, and among any people. The problem is that some of you perhaps never even heard of this idea until today. So that when you naturally sit down someplace, you pull out your smartphone rather than sit down and say, I'm going to spend 5-10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, or at least some time a day, just doing nothing but spiritual meditation. We've always got to be busy hearing something. You could hardly ride in a car without turning on the radio or doing something. You want voices coming at you nonstop. Puritans said most communion with God happens in privacy and most of it happens through meditation. So when you don't meditate, when you don't take time to meditate, you're actually missing one of, if not the, richest, means the grace that God brings to you. That was a Puritan teaching. So, Manton says, a gracious heart can distill useful meditations out of all things it meets with, as it sees all things in God, so it sees God in all things. Now, it's interesting that of those 41 books I mentioned, about a dozen of them, are nothing but occasional meditations. It's almost like a daily daily meditation, daily devotion. They give you 300, 
200, sometimes 365, occasional meditations. These are just occasional meditations that they really had and they just happened to write them down and they wanted to share them with people so that people would understand how to meditate occasionally. Now, occasional meditation had its dangers. Bishop Joseph Hall warned that when left unbridled, such meditations could easily wander from the Word of God and become superstitious as in the case of Roman Catholic spirituality. So, you had to restrain your imagination in meditations to, to principles of sacred writ. Now, some people have a natural medi- meditative imagination. John Bunyan was certainly one of those, wasn't he? In fact, that was one of the things Bunyan struggled about. You know, when he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress which became the best-selling book beside the Bible with a possible exception of Imitation of Christ by Thomas R. Kempis in all of church history. He took the book to several friends and said, you know, is this too imaginative? And is this kind of allegory? Is it something that's worthwhile publishing? Some of his friends said, ah, throw it on the fire, it's not worth anything. Others said, you know, it's kind of interesting to read. You know, I think you should publish it. It might do a little bit of good. And so Bunyan tells you, actually in the poem that prefaces Pilgrim's Progress, he really didn't know what to do and then figured, oh, well, I've done all this work. I might as well give it a try. Wow. It was a smashing success. So here's Bunyan meditating in prison, in prison for 12 and a half years, meditating, and he argues that his meditations in Pilgrim's Progress are biblical because he tethers every single event, every conversation, every action, nearly every sentence, directly to the Scriptures. That is the right way to meditate. Now, Bunyan said that meditation is a large field for our, medita- for our imagination to walk in with a great deal of spiritual gain because the Scriptures are very broad and comprehensive. So, that is what we call sanctified imagination, using occasional meditation tethered to the Word. Now, as important as that is, The Puritans said the more important form of meditation is deliberate meditation. Deliberate meditation. And that means, as Calamy puts it, when a man sets apart some time each day, goes into a private closet or for a private walk, and there does solemnly and deliberately meditate on the things of heaven. Like a bee that dwells and abides upon the flower to suck out all its sweetness. Thomas White wrote a book on meditation and said deliberate meditation draws from four sources. From the book of Scripture, from the book of practical truths of Christianity, from the book of Providence, or my own experiences based on the Word of God, and from the book of sermons. Now, White said, sermons in particular are fertile fields for meditation. It's far better to hear one sermon only and meditate on that than to hear two sermons and meditate on neither. You see, deliberate meditation means that you discipline your mind. You can do it when you do your regular daily devotions. You, you discipline your mind to take a truth and meditate on it for a while each day. That's why the Puritans called deliberate meditation the halfway house between prayer and Scripture reading. Here's what they would do. They'd read Scripture, then they'd meditate on what they read, and then they'd go to prayer and pray over both Scripture and their meditation to stir up their heart in the truths of God. And this meditation should be both doctrinal as well as practical. 
having the Word as its object and having our lives as its object as well. It involves the mind and the heart, said Richard Baxter. A set and solemn meditation each day. Thomas Watson said, Study is the finding out of a truth. Meditation is the spiritual improvement of that truth. The one searches for the vein of gold, the other digs out the gold. Study is like a winter sun that has little warmth and influence, but meditation melts the heart when it is frozen and makes it drop into tears of love. That's meditation. Occasional and deliberate. Now, why is this our duty? Or why is it necessary? Puritans give several reasons. I'll give them to you very quickly. Number one, our God commands us to meditate on His Word. And the Puritans would say, that alone is reason to meditate. You don't need any other reasons. God says so, you do it. And there are many scriptural citations here. Deuteronomy 6, verse 7. Psalm 19, verse 14. Psalm 119, verse 11, verse 15, verse 23, verse 28, verse 93, verse 99, and then lots of New Testament texts, Luke 2, 19, Mary pondered these things in her heart, John 4, 24, Ephesians 1, 18, and on and on it goes. And also many biblical examples of people meditating, Melchizedek, Isaac, Moses, Joshua, David, Mary, Paul, Timothy. The Bible goes out of its way to say all of these saints spent time meditating. So when we, when we fail to meditate, we disobey God's command of Psalm 1, verse 2, to meditate in the law and the truth of God day and night. Secondly, the Puritans would say we should meditate on God's Word as His letter, His epistle, sent to us. When you get a letter in the mail or on your email, you if it's a very personal letter with lots of truth in it, it's a deep, intimate letter, or it's a letter packed with uh, profound concepts, you don't just read it once real quickly and then reply, oh, thanks a lot, and move on. No, you meditate on it. And that's what you're to do because God wrote you this letter, this 1,200 page letter. You're to meditate on it. I will lift up my hands to thy commandments which I have loved and will meditate on thy statutes, says David in Psalm 119. Number three, you can't be a solid, growing, mature Christian without meditation. Thomas Manton. Faith is lean and ready to starve unless it be fed with continual meditation on the promises of God's Word. A Christian without meditation is like a soldier without arms and a workman without tools. Without meditation, the truths of God will not stick with us. The heart is hard. The memory is slippery. Without meditation, all is lost. Four. Without meditation the preached word will fail to profit us. It's like swallowing, said Richard Baxter, raw and undigested food. A man may eat too much, but he cannot digest too well. Hence, we must meditate. Five, without meditation, our prayers will be less effective. If meditation is the halfway house between Scripture reading and prayer, you see... When you meditate on what you've just read, it gives you fodder for prayer. And it helps you to pray. So you don't just pray the same old thing, same old, same old every day to God. Not that that upsets God. God likes to hear the voice of His children, even sometimes when they say the same things. But it enlarges your own heart and your own communion with God when you can build up your prayers with meditation. And six, Christians who fail to meditate often are Christians who cannot defend the truth. They've got no backbone. They haven't thought things through. They have little self-knowledge and little God-knowledge. Tis meditation, said Thomas Watson, that really makes a Christian. 
We must resolve upon the duty of meditation, said James Usher, if ever we mean to go to heaven. So, the Puritan saw meditation as so necessary that really, your whole eternal destiny depends on engaging in it, at least to some degree. So, how do you do it? The manner, the manner of meditation. Well, first of all, just a word about frequency and time. The Puritans said that in Israel, sacrifices were brought to the Lord morning and evening, and therefore it's natural to meditate in the morning and in the evening. Twice a day is ideal. If that's not possible, however, to do any extended meditation during both of those times, certainly one time a day. Because if you don't meditate on a regular basis, deliberately, your heart will soon grow cold. And when you don't deliber do deliberate meditation, your heart will grow so cold, you won't even do occasional meditation. And you'll be far from God in your backslide. William Bates compares it to a bird sitting on its nest with the eggs and saying, if the bird leaves her nest for a long space of time, the eggs will chill and are not fit for production. But where there is a constant incubation then they bring forth. So when we leave religious duties for spaces of days at a time, our affections chill and grow cold and we're not fit to produce holiness and comfort to our souls. Secondly, set a time for meditation and stick to that time. Ask yourself, when are you the very best mentally? Is it the morning? I'm not a morning person. I'm an evening person. I do much better meditating in the evening. But you find your time. And take the best time. Give that to God. If at all possible. The best time. When your mind is the brightest. Don't give God the leftovers. Give Him the first fruits, you see. And let the most seasonable time for you be a time that sets the tone for the rest of the day. Uh, whether the busyness of the day is behind you, or whether you're, whether you're going to plunge in the day, sanctify the day through your meditation. And then the Puritan said, do extra meditations on the Lord's Day. He's given you that whole day to worship Him. Let there be a sanctifying time, a special time between you and God on the Lord's Day, where you meditate. And they also had what they called special times or seasons of meditation. When God extraordinarily revives your spirit and you're growing in communion with Him, you want to do extra meditation at that time. It's a special time in your life when God's very, very close. When you're going through very deep afflictions, you want to sanctify them through extra meditation. When you're Seriously ill, even facing death, you want to, if your mind allows you to, to do extra meditation. When your heart is deeply touched by a sermon or by a sacrament or by some kind providence of God, it's best going to meditate at that time. Striking the iron when it is hot, they called it. Or... When you had an impulse on a given day, maybe you're going about your business, maybe you're driving down the road, and you've got this desire for God. It just springs up inside of you. That's a time to meditate. You see, these are special times of meditation. Or before some solemn duty, like the Lord's Supper, take time to meditate. And the third thing the Puritans stress, before we actually get to meditation itself, and the last thing I want to mention, is this. I'll read it from uh, William Bates. Ordinarily, meditate till you find some sensible benefit conveyed to your soul. Now, what does he mean? Well, he goes on to explain. He says, meditation is often like trying to build a fire from wet wood. 
Those who persevere will produce a flame. But often it's hard. You've been in the world, you might produce a bit of smoke and perhaps a few sparks, but it will take a while sometimes because you've been in the mud and the filth of the world to, to have a flame of holy affection that goes up toward God. But he says, persevere till the flame doth so ascend. Don't yield to laziness. Don't start meditating and meditate a minute or two and say, oh well, it's not moving my affections. No use. I'll try tomorrow, Lord. No. You persevere. Now, other Puritans, like Thomas Watson, said, there are days when you'll try to persevere, and you will persevere, but the flame still won't come. <laughs> Those days, you just have to say, Lord, please forgive me. My heart is, is cold. Uh, please help me tomorrow. So he has some compassion for that. Uh, but ordinarily, you see, you keep meditating on truth until it impacts your affections and you come close to God. You know, I mean, you know what it's like in prayer, right? The same thing's true in prayer. You get down on your knees, you go to bed at night, I hope you do anyway, and you pray, and you're tempted to get off your knees after about two minutes because, well, you don't seem to have contact with God anyway, what's the use? And maybe you've done that, and you've gotten in bed, and you've felt guilty, and you, and you said, ah, I really shouldn't go to bed without closer, closer feelings with God. And you get back down on your knees, and then suddenly while you're praying, the Lord comes and visits you through a text, through His Word, or, or just warms your heart, and you feel this real communion with Him, and, 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 and wow, you have this best time of prayer that you nearly missed through laziness. What's well, the same thing with meditation? As you want to pray until your hearts are stirred up, as well as your mind, so you want to do with meditation. All right. Preparation. How do we prepare ourselves as we go to meditate? Puritan said it's very important to clear your mind from the things of this world. So you get in a private spot. You... Turn to prayer. You ask God to help you to keep out, as um, as Kelly puts it rather quaintly, keep out outward company and inward company. He means try to banish all those thoughts from your mind of your relations with other people, all the busyness of the day, but also the inward convulsions of your own soul. Vain, worldly, distracting thoughts. If they enter into your mind, just say, Lord, please forgive me. And get right back to focusing on what you're going to meditate about. Approach the task with utmost seriousness. When you're doing your actual meditation for the day, you're doing the most important part of your day. And so don't let anything interrupt it. If you get a phone call, you just let the phone ring. They'll call back. They'll leave a message. You see, it's like family worship. You, your dad won't get up and get the phone while you're engaged in family worship because this is your audience time with the King of Kings. It's a little church service in your home. The living God is in your midst. This is a sacred time in your family. The time of meditation is like that individually. This is sacred time alone with God, the Puritan said. Now, when you... Prepare yourself for meditation. You not only undertake it seriously, believing that the triune God is with you at this time. His eye is on your heart, said Usher. And uh, the, the chief care you have then is to keep the rudder of your heart steady and consider that the three persons in the Holy Trinity are present with you as you meditate. You are talking with someone who's greater than the greatest prince on this earth. And so, as you do this, you find an area, you find an environment that is most conducive for meditation. Maybe it's your own bedroom. Or maybe you'll vary it up once in a while. Uh, I get a lot of the meditating as I walk through the woods behind our home. That's, I, I wish I did it more. But walking in nature can be 
a fruitful place to meditate if there's no distractions. The goal, you see, is to center your soul, your mind, your body upon the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. All right, guidelines. Finally, here we are. Number one, you begin by asking the Holy Spirit for assistance. You realize without the Holy Spirit, your meditations will flounder. Number two, you then read the Scriptures. Often you read it, the Puritans would advise you, in sequential order. You select a verse or doctrine from the Scripture you read this morning upon which to meditate. That's number two. You look at it and you say, what from what I read from Matthew 6 this morning really impresses me, is worthy of meditation. And maybe you'll conclude, you know, Jesus says here that you shouldn't be concerned too much about your clothing, about what you're going to eat, but about seeking first the kingdom of God. So the key verse here is verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You might want to settle on that. So what you do is you memorize, I'm just picking something off the top of my mind. You memorize that text. That's number three. You memorize that text. Put it into your mind. Say it over and over again. Allow it to stimulate you to strengthen your faith. And next, you fix your thoughts on the subject. This is number four. You fix your thoughts on the subject or the particular text. It can be both. It can be either. You might want to meditate on uh, God's providence. You might want to meditate on the attribute of God's goodness. Or you might want to meditate on a specific text. You might want to meditate on the heinousness of sin. You might want to meditate on the loveliness of Christ. Puritan said, generally speaking, an area where you're falling short in, that you need, maybe sin, yeah, you've got a little soft on sin lately. That would be good for you to meditate on that. Dastardliness, the spiritual insanity of sinning against a holy and a righteous God. What an awful thing sin is. You might need that. Or maybe Christ seems a little distant to you lately. Well, you might want to spend five minutes today meditating on the sympathetic priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ as He sits at His Father's right hand, being merciful to us through His Word. You pick areas that you think you need at the particular time. You fix your thoughts on it. And then you use your memory to focus on everything you know about it. In the Scripture, in providence, and in nature. Three books. Scripture, providence, nature. Some Puritans said four books. Your conscience. The book of conscience as well. And you ponder, like Mary, you ponder these things in your heart. You think of illustrations, you think of similitudes, you think of opposites, to enlighten your understanding, to inflame your affections. Here's one example from Calamy, thinking about sin. He's meditating on the subject of sin. Now, this sounds very complex when you first hear it, because you're not in the mode of meditating, but, but just glean a couple things from it. He says, you begin with a description of sin. What is sin? You proceed to the distribution of sin. You consider original sin, the cause of sin, the cursed actual sins and the fruits and effects of sin, the adjuncts and properties of sin in general, of personal sin in particular. Think of the opposite of sin, grace. Think of the metaphors in the Bible of sin, the titles given to sin, all that the Scripture says concerning sin. Think about sermons you've heard about sin. Now, that doesn't mean you'd have to do the, all of that the very first day. I, I would suggest you start out with one-minute meditations. Because even one minute in our busy day is hard for some of us. To sit in a chair and for one minute to think about heaven or to think about hell may be hard for us because we're used to our thoughts flittering all about. Now, the Puritans also said, when you have a given subject to meditate on, if, however, you feel as you begin to meditate that you're being led to meditate on a different but edifying subject, allow that to happen. 
allow that to happen. It may be that the Holy Spirit would rather have you think about another subject that particular morning. But as a general rule, you pick something from your scripture reading and you run, you run with that. Now, what do you do if your mind wanders? You don't just give up. You just rein it in. You apologize to God. Say you're sorry. Ask for forgiveness. And you press on. Number five. You stir up your affections, therefore, the Puritan said, such as love, desire, hope, courage, gratitude, zeal, and joy, to glorify God. Not just to have affections, but to glorify God. So you think about these truths and how they impact your life and the lives of others. You hold, the Puritan said, soliloquies with your own soul. Oh, my soul. What do you think of the beauty of Jesus Christ's sympathetic high priesthood? I mentioned that. That's how you deal with your own soul. David did it, didn't he? Over and over again. Oh, my soul, why are you sad and disquieted within you? Hope in God. So you speak to yourself, as it were. Hold dialogue with your own soul. But always, your goal is to glorify God. Six, having stirred up your affections to some degree, you then apply those meditations to your own soul in the form of resolutions. So, you want to live out your meditations. Let your resolutions be firm and strong, not mere wishes, but purposes or determinations, wrote Thomas White. You, you, you can write them down. Jonathan Edwards, for example, is 13 years old, spent every day meditating a good portion of the day, and he'd write down his resolutions. One of his resolutions was, after he meditated on the heinousness of sin, that he would see more evil in the smallest sin than he would in the greatest affliction. You see, this really helps you spiritually when you turn your applications into resolutions. And then, finally, you conclude with prayer, thankfulness, and psalm singing, the Puritan said. You close with prayer, thanking the Lord for helping you to some degree that day, and you sing a psalm, or you could sing it a hymn. But the goal is that singing lasts the longest on the memory bank, the Puritan said. So you want to end with singing so that can go with you into the day. Now, what are the subjects you meditate on? Now, believe it or not, this was very tedious, but I went through all 41 books and I took all the subjects that they advised to meditate on and I made a chart. I divided it up into all the different doctrines <laughs> And there's thousands of things they gave to meditate on. But guess what were the top four things that were mentioned the most frequently in the books? Actually, it was the exact, what the Puritans called the exact four last things. Heaven, hell, death, and judgment. They really focused on meditating on eternal things, you see. But they also, very common in the list, was the heinousness of sin, uh, the value of Christ, especially His passion and death and love. The promises of God was frequently mentioned, as well as various attributes of God. But the number one subject was heaven, our future home. When's the last time you sat in your chair and meditated even for 30 seconds on where you're going if you're a Christian? This life is like a little dot in the vast eternity of time. 99.999999 thousand nines percent of your time is going to be spent in eternity. Shouldn't you be meditating a bit more about heaven? Or if you're not a believer, about hell? You know, the Puritans said there are many benefits of meditation. I, I can't read them all to you, but let me just give you a dozen or so. And I'll just read them briefly. Meditation helps you focus on the triune God, to enjoy Him in all of His persons, intellectually, 
spiritually, practically, doctrinally, aesthetically. Meditation helps you increase your knowledge of sacred truth. It takes the veil off the face of truth. Proverbs 4 verse 2 says, Meditation is the nurse of wisdom because it promotes the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom. Meditation enlarges your faith and your affections. Thomas Watson called it the bellows of the affections. Meditation helps foster repentance and reformation of life. Meditation is a great friend to your memory. If you meditate often, you'll remember things better. Your mind will be sharper. It's a discipline to be cultivated. It will help you in times of worship because you've transfused Scripture throughout your soul throughout the week. You'll better be able to take in sermons. You'll profit more from them. It's a great aid to prayer. It helps you hear and read, and understand, and discuss better. It helps you see the heinousness of sin more. It helps, Jeremiah 4.14, it helps to pre- prevent vain and sinful thoughts. Your mind is more disciplined. You can rein it in easier. It provides you inner resources from which to draw. Psalm 77, 10-12. It helps you persevere in faith. And it provides relief in affliction. Because through all your meditation, you've learned to meditate about how to cope with difficult things. So when they come, you're better prepared. It promotes gratitude. And most of all, Psalm 49 verse 3, it glorifies God. All right, let me just give you uh, a couple obstacles and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be done. Very briefly now. Number one, some people say, I'm unfit to meditate. And I'm too ignorant. I don't know enough theology. My thoughts are always running helter-skelter. It's just not for me. Well, the Puritans would say this, disability, ignorance, and wandering thoughts offer no exemption from duty. Your loss of ability does not imply God's loss of right. You're probably unfit because you've neglected meditation and have not loved the truth as you should. It's like a servant of a master being drunken and saying, I cannot work today because I'm drunk. That's no excuse. You remedy your problem by meditating, not by not meditating. And if you begin and pray for help, you'll find it becoming easier and sweeter in due course. That was Thomas Manton. Number two, I'm too busy. I'm too busy meditate. Answer, what? Too busy for the greatest business of your life? You see, Martin Luther once said to Philip Melanchthon, Philip, I've got so much to do tomorrow, I need to spend an extra hour in prayer and meditation. What happens when we're very busy? Well, our prayer time squeezes down. Because for us, prayer and meditation is like an appendix to who we are, like an appendix to a book. But for the Reformers and Puritans, prayer and meditation is the book. It is who we are. And they wanted to pray their way, meditate their way, through everything they did. And finally, some people object and they say, well... you know, I've got so many things to do. I've got friendships to maintain. I've got worldly pleasures. And I, I, I just I don't want to give these things up. And the Puritans would answer, the sweetness of religion is incomparably more than all the pleasures of sense. Trim back your life so you do not only have time to meditate, but so that meditation becomes the foundation of your life. So we must discipline ourselves to meditate. So in conclusion, how are you doing? Probably you're like me right now, feeling a bit guilty. We should be meditating. We should be meditating. It will help us in nearly every area of our lives. 
And it will help us above all to stir up our faith and to grow closer to God. Do you want to grow in grace? Meditate on the truths of God. And if you're not a believer, neglecting meditation and just running headlong into hell is not the answer for you. You don't have to go to hell. There is a way. Repent. Believe the Gospel. Turn to the living God. And begin to meditate upon His truth and His ways. As one Puritan says, and with this I'll conclude, if the farmer meditates upon his land, the physician upon his patients, the lawyer upon his cases, the store owner upon his goods, why shouldn't Christians meditate upon their God and Savior? Let's pray. Great God of heaven, we thank thee so much for the gift and the art of meditation and for how the Puritans have hammered out a path before us to give us so much wise counsel. Please, Lord, help us to truly meditate, to think about the things of God prayerfully, scripturally, to put them into action, to move our affections so that we will be gripped by Thy truth and help us to live out Thy truth and to put it into practice, to do the sermons we hear, to do the scripture readings we read, to do the truth of the living God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.